We're going to go ahead and get started. Looks like we've got quorum and we've got a lot of material to cover, so I'll let us begin here. First of all, welcome. Thanks for coming today. Uh, you're tuning into our webinar on the 2017 National Electrical Code, a preview of proposed changes. And I can tell you we've got a lot of material. This may be our, our uh, highest amount of material that we've yet to deliver in an hour-long webinar, so we want to make sure that we get to it all. So I'm going to talk as little as possible so that I can turn things over to our host quickly. I do want to go over a couple of quick housekeeping things with you. The first is that we, we do allow questions during the webinar, but it's easiest for us if we answer those questions at the end of the webinar. So what you'll do if you have a question for Bob, if you look at your GoToWebinar interface there, you, see, you should see a little tab about two-thirds of the way down labeled questions. If you'll just submit your question via that interface there, we will gather those up and answer as many as possible at the end of the webinar, uh, still trying to, to cut it off at, at the hour mark there. So if we're not able to get to your questions, I've also included Bob's email address at the end of the webinar, and you can ask your questions directly of him. But we do intend to do some Q&A at the end of the webinar. And then uh, also know that we will have a survey at the end of the webinar, and our hope is to gather feedback from you about the value of what you've seen here. Uh, so please wait just a moment uh, before signing off to take that survey so that we can continue to deliver good material to you. So then with that, I'm just going to get right into it here. Now the first thing I want to do is to give you a very quick introduction to who we are. When we put out an invitation to our webinar, we tend to get folks from a lot of different places, and you may not be familiar with everything that we do. So very briefly, we are TPC Training Systems. We are the leader in industrial skills training. We offer an unrivaled lineup of tra training solutions uh, through a variety of different modalities and training types. Uh, TPC Online is, as the name implies, our online training division with over a thousand hours of training content delivered through a web-based interface. TPC Consulting Services provides customized training solutions. TPC iSchematic provides system mapping solutions. And TPC TrainCo, who you're going to hear from today, delivers instructor-led training. And now the National Electrical Code is a really important part of what we do within the TPC Train Co. Instructor-Led Training Division. We deliver hundreds of National Electrical Code classes each year. And those classes are designed to help fulfill the requirements for having a live instructor-led training as part of a qualified electrical worker program. And if you, now this, of course, is an exciting time for us because we're right at the beginning of another code cycle. As you may know, the code changes every three years. Uh, so what Bob will show you today is just a preview of those code changes to get the full download and to get the, the full instruction on what the code changes mean for you and your company. You should attend the two-day seminar, which we offer in hundreds of cities across the country. If you want to see the schedule for that, those courses begin in October, and that URL is up in the upper right corner, tpctrainco.com slash NEC2017. You can see our full schedule. You can also contact us about scheduling one on-site at your facility. And this is much of a sales pitch as I'm going to give you here. Like I said, I want to get right into the content. Uh, before I do that, we're going to take a quick poll question. Uh, typically what we do is do the poll at the beginning of the, the webinar, and then we'll come back and share the results at the end. Uh, so let me get that poll question out to you here. So our poll question today is, do you need CEUs, continuing education units, on NEC to maintain your license? If you're maintaining your electrical license, do you need this? And we've got poll results coming in. We'll wait just a minute. And it looks like most of our audience has had a chance to vote. So I'll give it just another second, and I will close that poll. And as I said, we'll come back to it at the end of the show. Okay, let me offer a brief introduction for Bob. Uh, Bob is our webinar pro. Uh, he's also a 30-year veteran as a master electrician and a 10-year veteran as a TPC Train Co. instructor. 
and he is an expert on the National Electrical Code, as I'm sure you will agree once you've uh, seen what he has to talk you through today. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Bob. And this is always the slightly scary part of the presentation where we have to move controls from one location to the other. So just bear with me a moment So I pass the ball to Bob here, and uh, then he'll take you through the material. Okay, Bob, looks like you have control. Excellent. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you for organizing this webinar. And thank everybody for attending, just as Eric mentioned before. I'm going to start, and first I guess I'll start with this, where a lot of this information came from. So the NFPA has already um, uploaded the first revision of the 2017 uh, on nfpa.org and then uh, finally we have the second revision up there. A lot of that information that you're about to see came from the second revision. Also uh, some presentations that were uh, um, at the NFPA conference in, in Las Vegas just, just about a month ago. So not, um, you know, pretty current information. Of course, I still am receiving emails every now and then from the NFPA that uh, there are some amendments. So I think that uh, we're pretty good with the information we have here. I don't think much of this will get changed. But you can see on this slide that there were 4,012 public inputs that were submitted. And you know, maybe the people here on this call that are as old as I am can remember that those we just used to submit changes to the code. But now they're called public inputs. From all those public inputs, um, the code-making panels came up with about over, over 1,200 first revisions. And um, then they went ahead and had some public comments on those and came up with all their second revisions. So we're going to take a look at, at some of the most significant changes and definitely not will not cover all of the revisions that are going to appear in that code. But we're going to do our best to give you some, some of the um, highlights. Of course, five new articles. So that's something that's very important that we should take a look at because you talk about some major revisions when you have five new articles, then we probably ought to take a look at those first. So the, the first article appears in Chapter 4, Article 425, Fixed Resistance and Electrode Industrial Process Heating Equipment. So th this is large type of uh, heating equipment in uh, industrial uh, applications. It's going to be boilers, electro boilers, duct heaters, strip heaters, all these different types of heaters. It is not going to apply to heating and room air conditioning for personal spaces. So this is a new article that if we are going to install this type of equipment, we should become very familiar with that article. The next uh, article I'd like to take a look at. I want to first um, give you an idea that because of deregulation, there are a lot of facilities now that are producing their own electricity. I've been to many plants that they have um, photovoltaic systems on their roofs and they supply power to their building uh, through their um, generating system that they have on their roofs. So knowing that and, and the technical committees realizing that these systems are, are becoming uh, very economical and they're very large. They now have a way to produce this electricity and then in a little while you're going to see that we have to have a way to store it in case we don't need it all right at the moment and then we have to have a way to distribute it. So a lot of these articles that we see here are going to deal with that because of deregulation in the utility level we can now do this. We can have our own production sources. So the first one, Article 691, large-scale photovoltaic um, systems. These are going to be systems that are 5 megawatts and larger. So a little bit different than Article 690, which was our regular uh, photovoltaic article. But these are very large systems. And um, a lot of these don't currently comply with the requirements in Article 690. So this is really going to help our inspectors when they have to come and make a determination if that system was installed properly. And uh, also our engineering um, 
design people that are going to help design the, these systems. And you can see a picture of, a, of one of these types of systems. So these are getting very large, very prevalent around the country. I know there's one going in Indiana as we speak currently. The next one, like I mentioned, we have to have a way to store that um, energy. So Article 706, Energy Storage Systems, it's going to apply to all permanently installed uh, systems operating at over 50 volts AC or over 60 volts DC. They could be standalone or interactive with other um, power production sources. We could, you know, have a interactive inverter with the utility or another system. But um, basically, this gives us a way to store our energy, mostly probably through batteries, until we need to uh, use that energy. Typical energy storage system, you can see that uh, we have the substation that we could you know, decide to uh, sell some of that energy back to the utility, use it for ourselves, uh, whatever we might uh, want to do with that energy that, that we just uh, produced with that uh, large-scale photovoltaic system. This article 710 is a, for a standalone system, so a much smaller system here. And you can see it's going to supply some single 120-volt supply. And it's going to be um, single phase. It will probably, if you could picture, maybe you've got um, a, a large solar panel maybe on the side of the road, and it's supplying maybe a couple lights just flashing. So this that's a standalone system, really not connected to anything else, going to supply something that is relatively kind of a small load. Then, of course, the larger system, we do need a way to distribute that uh, energy that we just produced. So Article 712, they give us a DC uh, microgrid. And it's a power distribution system. It consists of one or more interconnected DC power sources. We could have converters. You could have DC loads, AC loads. Typically, this type of uh, grid is going to supply some DC power to us for lighting, communications, um, type, some type of uh, computer or drives or whatever. But now what do we have? We have a way to uh, produce our electricity, store it, and distribute it. And here's an example of a DC microgrid. Um, basically, you're going to supply the end user there, that, that computer, for some power. Next, we get into Article 90. And of course, we are talking about a document that, historically, we always think of it as the installation of electrical conductors and equipment. Now they have added the word removal of electrical conductors and equipment. And we had some of this before in Article 590, temporary wire wiring. We had to remove that wiring at the end of the completed installation. Up in uh, uh, Chapter 8 in communications, we had to remove some abandoned communication cables. Now this is going to apply to the, the whole NEC, that the code is now going to cover the installation and removal of conductors, equipment, raceway, signaling. So we've got to make sure that we are using safe work practices when we do remove um, anything that is used anymore. This uh, change is, is very interesting, and I'm sure that a lot of you were the same, under the same impression that I was for a long time, that chapters 1 through 4 always apply generally to every installation I do. So it really doesn't matter what the installation is. I've got to know the requirements in chapters 1 through 4. And chapters 5, 6, and 7, I was always under the impression that those modified chapters 1 through 4. But the technical committee has made a nice change here or a clarification that these chapters can actually modify themselves also. So these chapters can modify all the way from 1 through 7. So we might see something in chapter 5 has those locations that might have an impact on chapter 6. So they wanted to make sure that that was a good clarification for us that these modification or supplemental chapters can also impact each other. 
Of course, Chapter 8 has always been a standalone chapter. So if Chapter 8 is going to make a reference to Chapters 1 through 7, okay, then we have to pay attention to that. But otherwise, Chapter 8 is basically its, its own standalone chapter. But the big change here is 5, 6, and 7 can modify it itself or any Chapter 1 through 7. This is a great um, clarification, especially for me. I, I'm one of the people that Eric talked about that goes out and conducts seminars, and I'll have quite a few people in front of me, and they have asked me this question for a long time. And thank goodness now the technical committee has, has sort of clarified what I've been telling people. So the definition for readily accessible pretty much has always been capable of being reached quickly don't have to move anything, don't have to go get a ladder. I can walk right up to it and put my hands on it. Many people in my classes would always ask me, well, wonder if the panel's locked. I always would tell them, it's still readily accessible. And they said, how can it be? Because I have to go get a key or whatever. Well, I always told them, I said, because it's under 24-hour supervision, you know, and we don't want the public to have access to those overcurrent devices, it's readily accessible to the qualified people that do that possess that key. So the technical committee put in that other than keys, and that's the key for this one, so that if it is locked, but there is supervision there to make sure that somebody can get to that quickly, it is still readily accessible. And I want to thank the technical committees for doing that for us. 110.3c is a new section. Um, 110.3 has always stopped at B, and B was one of the most far-reaching effects that the codebook has. And, and 110.3b always said that if, if I install UL listed equipment, I did have to um, follow the instructions that came with that equipment. And that was kind of a far-reaching um, effect that I had to make sure that I knew the instructions inside and out because they really did become part of the code. Well, now they've added C, and it says that you know when we test these products, we list these products, it has to be performed by a recognized qualified electrical testing lab. It has to be in accordance with applicable product standards. And using those product standards plus the installation requirements in the code, we should come up with a safe installation. The informational note that goes along with 110.3c tells us that OSHA does have a list of these uh, acceptable testing laboratories. So OSHA recognizes some qualified electrical testing laboratories if we need help uh, recognizing some of those. So anytime we do install uh, equipment, it has been listed. They do have, it has to be a recognized qualified testing laboratory, and uh, that should uh, really help our inspectors also. Here's a new section, and in my mind, I always thought of this being covered by 110.3b, because 110.3b would say, well, you have to follow the instructions. If I pick a circuit breaker up and I look at the side of the circuit breaker, it would always give me a torque value, uh, and I always was under the impression I better, I better follow that value they put on the side of that breaker or that bus bar or whatever it was that I had in my hand. Well, they become very specific now in this section. If a tightening torque is indicated as a numeric value on equipment or in the installation instructors provided by the manufacturer, then we have to use that calibrated torque tool. And uh, that's how we're going to achieve the, the needed torque that we need. Very important, in my opinion, because the next slide will give you an idea why. And it's because if we don't install this to the to the correct torque setting, you can see that down the road, there's going to be some issues there, and then there's going to be some downtime. We're going to have to go back. We're going to have to retorque. We're going to have to hope that we didn't have any issues <laughs> in the meantime that before we did this tomography. So, excellent uh, addition to the new 2017 version of the code. 110.16 has always been near and dear to my heart, and I have submitted many public inputs uh, at this uh, on this particular section myself. So the general section that we've always had, and we, this has been in the code book uh, since 2002, electrical equipment, such so switchboards, switchgear, panel boards, all these all these pieces of equipment, and other than dwelling units, so that 
leaves out single family and duplex homes, but every other building, um, has to be a field or factory mark to warn qualified persons of potential electric arc flash hazards. Well, it doesn't tell us what has to be on there. It does say we have to meet the requirements of 110.21b, which was new in um, the 2014 version, but basically 110.21b just said that we had to have some words and or colors and or symbols to indicate the hazard. Uh, the label had to be fixed uh, to the equipment, had to be durable to withstand the environment. Informational notes said that, you know, if we should follow ANSI Z535 uh, standard when we put uh, that label on there. But really kind of a generic um, requirement. The label didn't really tell us exactly what had to be on that label. Well, now they've come up with this brand new section, 110.16b. And you can see that this is for service equipment. So only at service equipment, but it's a great step and I think we're going in the right direction here. Again, it says in other than dwelling units, so we don't have to worry too much about single family and duplex homes. But it does say that we're going to have a permanent label here. It's going to be field or factory applied. I think it's going to be kind of tough for the factory to apply it unless they're, they're really involved with the uh, installation. But if that service equipment is 1,200 amps or more, the label has to meet the requirements of 110.21b, which we just said. You know, it has to be some words, symbols, colors fixed to the equipment. But what does it have to contain for information? Now, the National Electrical Code is giving us some guidance on what we have to put on that label for information. We have to have the voltage on there. So that's going to be very consistent with NFPA 70E. So 70E also tells us we have to have the voltage on there. But we also have to have on here the available fault current at that, right at the service. So that's where I think the factory will have a hard time because they might not know the size of our transformer or or the length of our conductors. So out in the field, we might have to determine that. Also going to have to have the clearing time. So the factory definitely could help us with that. They're going to know the clearing time of the protective device there and the date the label was applied. So now we have some information that is going to go on at least a service rated 1,200 amps or more. You can see the exception down here that if we have applied a label in accordance, let's say, with NFPA 70E, then we don't have to worry about this label. But this is going to give us some guidance to give us a little bit of indication of maybe the amount of incident energy that might come at us, at least at the service. So we might be able to put some PPE on that, that could protect our, our qualified workers. So I'm very pleased to see us going in this direction. I want to give you an example of, of that. So you can see the top part of this label, 110, that's what we've always had in 110.16. Very generic label, arc flash and shock hazard appropriate PPE required. Well, it didn't really tell us what, but at least we had something there to tell us there was probably a, a hazard involved. But now 110.16b at the bottom, we've got to have the available fault current, so we're going to have to know the transformer size, we're going to have to know the impedance of the transformer, we're going to have to know the voltage. Then the clearing time can definitely come from the manufacturer. The voltage will be have to be on there and the date the label was applied. This could really help us if we wanted to begin our incident energy analysis, um, really help us if we wanted to use the PPE category method. We could find out if we were under the right parameters to select a PPE category for uh, the personal protective equipment for one of our workers. 110.21A2, and, and so this is equipment that has been sent out and has been reconditioned. Chances are we never did anything with that equipment. We sent it somewhere, maybe a, maybe a circuit breaker was sent out to be reconditioned, comes back, we put it in and we just keep going with, with life. Well now it says reconditioned equipment shall be marked with the name, trademark, other descriptive marking, on who actually reconditioned that equipment. It also has to have the date of the reconditioning on there. And this reconditioned equipment, it has to be identified as reconditioned and shall be acceptable only if approved by the authority having jurisdiction. So approval of this reconditioned equipment is not going to be based solely on the equipment's original listing. 
So that means we've got to have some type of marking on here that might say something to the effect that um, this equipment has been refurbished by XYZ company and the date that it was uh, reconditioned. That way the authority having jurisdiction would have a at least somewhere to go to determine if right now it is going to be uh, acceptable and approved under his jurisdiction. You can see that there is an informational note that uh, if a product was listed when originally manufactured that uh, it can be labeled uh, with the label symbol or other identifying mark of the organization that did perform the examination of the equipment as it was originally manufactured and so one method to, to do that would be uh, for the um, um, organization to come back out and maybe do another inspection and, and uh, feel, you know, do the uh, listing in the field. So if we do have some equipment that is going to be sent out, that company that does that uh, reconditioning is now going to have to put their stamp on there. And that should help our, our inspectors a lot. So all this equipment, you could see if it did get sent out, it would definitely have to have a label when it, when it came back. 110.24, they've been playing with for quite some time. And uh, this, again, is available fault current. Pretty much um, it's service equipment, again, at other than dwelling units. And so now if um, I do install this equipment, um, have it refurbished or whatever, they added the word or. So we've got to put the available fault current on, the, on our service equipment. So it says the calculation shall be documented. So whoever did the calculations to determine what the available fault current was, it has to be made available to those who design, install, inspect, maintain, or operate the system. So now we've got operate the system. So very important available fault current. All of our protection, of course, is going to start there, whether we are trying to eliminate arc flash hazards or whether we're trying to coordinate a system we have to know that available file current. Brand new 110.26A4 uh, working space. So this working space that they're talking about now is really in spaces that are kind of small in nature. And so we can see that where we have equipment operating at a thousand volts or less and it might have to go up and need servicing while energized, then the following has got to apply. If we are above some type of um, suspended ceiling. We've got to have an opening there that is going to be at least 22 inches by 22 inches. If it's in a crawl space, uh, we've got to have an opening there that 22 inches by 30 inches, so we might have to crawl in there ourselves. Uh, the width of the space has to be the width of the equipment, or 30 inches, whichever is greater. The doors do have to be able to be, be opened. And the space in the front is going to comply with 110.26A1, which means we're, you know, we're going to probably have to have about 36 inches of, of space there. Um, the maximum height of the working space shall be the height necessary to install the equipment, because you're probably not going to have much room above this equipment. To give you an idea, you can see that we do have equipment above these spaces. We have to be able to get up there. We have to be able to open the door. We have to be able to service this equipment. So uh, very nice addition to the 2017 National Electrical Code. Inspections and tests. So this is like we're commissioning some equipment now. It's We've installed it. Uh, might not even have energized it yet. We're getting ready to energize it. Maybe getting ready to turn it over to the uh, owner. So pre-energization and operating tests. Where required elsewhere in this code? the complete electrical system design, settings for protective, uh, maybe ground fault settings, uh, switching control circuits. This all has to be prepared in advance, made available on request to the authority having jurisdiction, and it has to be tested when first installed on the site. We have to have a report covering the results of that test, and that has to be made available to the authority having jurisdiction. So this is going to really help the uh, inspector to make sure that all the settings are, are set properly and that safety is in the mind of, of everybody involved with installing this equipment. 
This gets us up to Chapter 2, and this is in Article 210, um, Branch Circuits. And they, there's a new exception here. So always in Article 210, we had to identify if we had different systems in the facility. So basically, if we had 208.120 and we had 482.77, we might see on a panel that we had black, red, blue with a white neutral for the 208.120. We might see the symbol that we see here, brown, orange, yellow, with a gray neutral for the 482.77. Well, a new exception here. In existing installations, if there's a system that already exists, for instance, maybe I had a small commercial building and in that building was 208.120. That's the service that was brought in. All of a sudden, we're adding a different voltage system. So now we're going to bring in 482.77. It's permissible to mark only the new system voltage. So only those panels that are 482.77 have to be marked. The existing unidentified system doesn't have to be identified at uh, all these points. Um, Labeling shall be required at each voltage system distribution equipment to identify that only one voltage system has been marked. So it has to say these words. Other unidentified systems exist on the premises. So we would have a good idea that if we took a look and saw black, red, blue, hey, there's 208.120 here also. So got to make sure those words are on there if we do add another system to an existing system that is already in a facility. 210.8, GFCI protection for personnel. And they wanted to clarify where we're going to measure um, the distance that we, that we have to have for many of these GFIs. And so it, it, it tells us, uh, first of all, of course, it has to be readily accessible. So we have to be able to walk right up to that um, GFCI. But it says, for the purposes of this section, when determining the distance from receptacles, the distance shall be measured at the path of the cord. So if I have a receptacle underneath the sink, maybe for um, my disposal, well, I have to think about how that cord would take its path and to see if that is within six feet of that sink or not. If it's not within six feet of that sink, maybe I don't have to put a GFCI. But um, basically, they wanted to give us a method and give the inspectors a method on how they can measure that path to see if that receptacle would have to be GFCI protected or not. 210.11 C4, dwelling unit garages. Historically, we would install a, a garage circuit, and that garage circuit would have no other outlets. So the garage would basically be a circuit. That, would, that circuit would be dedicated for the uh, receptacles that were in that garage. So now they're telling us that there is an exception, that this circuit, this garage circuit, is now permitted to supply readily accessible outdoor receptacle uh, outlets. So if I did want to use the circuit in the garage for a receptacle right outside, that's no problem. You can see here it would be very handy on this detached garage. I wouldn't have to run two circuits to that detached garage. I'd run just one circuit. The outside receptacles could go on that same circuit that I brought into the garage. Meeting room receptacles. So if you're like me and you attend a lot of conferences or you're actually instructing in one of these meeting rooms, um, this is uh, pretty important. So we, I don't think we ever have enough receptacles now. Half of my students will come in and they have laptops with them. They need a place to plug in. There's extension cords everywhere inside that meeting room. But now they're telling us this. Each meeting room and other than dwelling units shall be provided with receptacle outlets. The number and type of outlets are going to be determined in accordance with 71B through E, which we'll look at in a second. Placement of these are going to be in accordance with 71E. If you have a room or space and it's provided with movable petitions, the room size is going to be determined uh, with, the position, with the petitions in the position that results in the smallest size meeting room. And so for the purposes, of, they give us a little informational note here. Remember, the informational notes are not part of the regulation, but they do try to clarify or give us more information about um, the sections uh, of the National Electrical Code. So it says the purposes of this, uh, meeting rooms are typically designed or intended for the gathering of seated occupants. 
conferences, deliberations, similar purposes, where portable electronic equipment is likely to be used, projectors. These guys are talking about me. And so let's take a look at B through E now so that we can get an idea where these receptacles uh, have to be located. So in B, in meeting rooms having a floor area of 1,000 square feet or less, the receptacle outlets have to be installed in accordance with 210.52, uh, 1 through 4. Of course, 210.52 is going to tell us that no point along the floor line can be more than 6 feet from a receptacle. So that means, and I'm looking at my um, laptop charger right now, which I do have a cord that is at least 6 feet long, that I should not have to use an extension cord anymore when I go into a new meeting room after 2017. Um, and then it goes on to, to give us in C some different size uh, of meeting rooms. So a meeting room that is at least 12 feet wide and has a floor area of at least 215 square feet and not more than 1,000 square feet, you've got to have at least one receptacle located in the floor at a distance not less than 6 feet from any fixed wall um, for each 215 square foot uh, or major portion of floor space. So that means we're going to have some floor receptacles that we'll be able to utilize for projectors and laptops or, or whatever. Part D of this, um, movable room petitions, you've got to have at least one floor receptacle for each 12 linear feet or major fraction thereof of movable wall measured horizontally along the floor to serve each meeting room uh, created by that petition. So you've got to sort of have a good idea where these petitions are going to be, and, or you've got to have plenty of receptacles, which um, I like the idea of plenty of receptacles. These receptacles have to be located within 18 inches of that petition. And E, in applying the provisions, the total number of receptacle outlets shall not be less than as determined in B, C, and D. These receptacle outlets shall be permitted to be located as determined by the designer or the building owner. But basically, the intention here is we're not going to have cords all over these meeting rooms anymore. And we're going to have places that we can utilize the electricity and still be safe. 230.29 supports over buildings. So, of course, Article 230 talks about services, so we're talking about service conductors here that pass over a roof. And um, these are going to be securely supported by substantial structures. So for a grounded system, so most of our systems of course are grounded, where the substantial structure is metal. Well let's stop right there for a minute and I'd like to have you look down here at the picture some. If, if these conductors right here, if they actually extended way over here to this part of the roof, well, there could be quite a sag right in here, so we might have some type of metal uh, structure keeping these conductors up above that roof as high as we wanted them to be. And so if that is the case, if these service conductors were coming way across this roof and we had to keep them up off that roof, and, that's, and that structure that we're using to keep them up there is metal, then that has to be bonded by means of a bonding jumper and listed connector to the grounded overhead service conductor. And where practicable, such supports shall be independent of the building. So usually it's going to be some type of metal stanchion or, or whatever that's going to keep these conductors away from that roof if they do pass away uh, quite a distance over the top of that roof. If that's the case, then we do have to bond uh, that structure to our grounded conductor that's coming in from the service. 230.70A4. Um, to me, this is important, and it's important from a f uh, fireman's point of view, I guess. So if I'm installing a single family or duplex service, that service disconnecting means is now going to have to be installed on the outside of the structure at the meter location or at the nearest point of entrance of the service conductors. They are giving us some time to comply with this. So they're giving us until July 1st, 2020. What does this mean? The fire department's not going to have to pull the meter anymore when they actually, the fire is engulfed in flames. So the firemen pretty much want to worry about the fire. They don't want to have to worry about another hazard, which is electricity. So now we're going to be providing this external disconnect. It's going to allow for that um, disconnection from the utility to the premises wiring. And 
it could also it could be a remote control device that would that's fine um, that's no problem and it's going to give us a, a, some time to be able to implement uh, these devices so you can see that we have our meter socket here and then over here we would have our service disconnecting means located uh, very close so the firemen could come and de-energize that building and put you know put that fire out without having to worry about something else Here's a new section for us, and we've always had 240.87, which helped us with uh, uh, the energy that might be present at, at some of our equipment. So now there's a new section 240.67, and it's about fuses. So we are in our overcurrent protection, of course, um, and if the fuses are 1,200 amps or higher, and uh, then 240.67A and B shall apply. This also has a has a date in the future to give our manufacturers time to be able to come up with with uh, the equipment that we need. So A says documentation shall be available to the people that are going to design, install, operate, or inspect the installation as to the location of the fuses. So I've got to have some documentation here. A fuse that if it is 1,200 amps or higher shall have a clearing time of 0.07 seconds or less at the available arcing current. If that is not the case, then we're going to have to provide some protection from 240.87, either differential relaying, some um, uh, maintenance mode on an overcurrent device, some type of arc flash mitigation system, or, or some other approved equivalent means. So these, these large size fuses, we want to make sure that we can protect our workers from that incident energy so we are going to specify a clearing time and if we can't satisfy this clearing time then they are giving us other methods to be able to protect uh, our qualified workers. That does bring us to 240.87 which Arc Energy Reduction has been, been there for quite a while and they did add 6 and 7. We pretty much had 1 through 5 in 2014 now they've added 6 and 7 Number six, instantaneous override that is less than the available arcing current. So if you see down here, and I, I put this little note in because if you do go to uh, nfpa.org, you can see some of the stuff that came from the first res, uh, revision. And there was a public comment uh, that said someone could avoid using one of these uh, methods by turning down the instantaneous trip. And then after the final inspection, they turn it back up so they can achieve selective coordination. So we really wanted to make sure that uh, they couldn't play with that too well. So put in an instantaneous override that is less than the available arcing current or an approved equivalent means. So the National Electrical Code, when we do install equipment, is very concerned about worker safety. And they're giving us some methods to be able to address that. 250.22, circuits not to be grounded. They did add number six, so class two load side circuits, suspended ceiling low voltage power grid distribution systems. That was a new article in 2014, and so the ceiling be a wiring method, and that does not have to be grounded. So you can see that these are going to be very, uh, probably 24 volt um, circuits protected by a class two power supply no need uh, to do any grounding there. 250.30A4, this is going to give us some good clarification. It, it tells us here that the building or structure grounding electrode system shall be used as the grounding electrode for the separately derived system. So, a lot of comments on this, especially when I'm teaching generators. So if I'm teaching generators, and that generator is a separately derived system, many of my students say, well, we're going to drive a ground rod in and be done with it. Well, the problem with that is 250.50 says that all grounding electrodes have to be bonded together at, on our premises. So we can't just drive a ground rod on a separately derived system and think that we've satisfied uh, Article 250. They are telling us right now that um, we have to use the building or structure grounding electrode system. They all have to be tied together. So if we have a ground rod anywhere there, we have metal water pipe, we have building steel, maybe we put a ground ring in, 
they all have to be bonded together. The rebar and the concrete, that would be choice number three in 250.52. These will all be bonded together, no matter where that separately derived system is. Uh, very nice change. If we are going to increase the size of our ungrounded conductors for to account for voltage drop, now they want us to increase our equipment grounding conductor uh, in the same proportion. So if the ungrounded conductors are increased, then our equipment grounding conductors shall be increased in size also, and it's going to be in the same proportion as the ungrounded conductors were increased. We increase the size of our ungrounded conductors. That means we have more of the available fault current that could flow, so our equipment grounding conductor has to be able to handle that also. 300.5 is our table that if we are going to uh, put a wiring method underground, the depth that that, that wiring method is going to be installed. So um, that's fine. We now have a new note here about um, landscape lighting that if we do have um, uh, some listed low voltage lighting systems, if we look at the instructions and they allow us to be at a lesser depth than what this table says, then that's okay. So currently, the table tells us that this landscape lighting has to be at six inches, but many of the instructions are going to tell us that we can be at a much lesser depth because we have to either repair or, or whatever, add to um, this wiring and want to be able to get to it fairly easily. So if the instructions allow us to be at a lesser depth, then that's okay. Above ground wiring methods, 300.37, and this deals with um, airfield lighting. So we got regulators and airfield lighting at, a, at an airport. If it is installed in a vault, then it can be exposed. So they gave us a new exception here. Airfield lighting cable used in series circuits, powered by regulators, installed in restricted airport lighting vaults, it's okay for them to be exposed. So, and um, most of them were probably already exposed, so now we're going to have an exception for that. This table is in Article 310, and if we had installed wiring on a rooftop, they always had, we had to make an adjustment for our ampacity. And they gave us, um, depending on how close we were to that rooftop, we had to add a certain degree of temperature and then go to the um, a, another table to see what our multiplier would be and see how much our ampacity was reduced. Well, uh, the International Association of Electrical Inspectors, the Southern Nevada chapter, sponsored a um, let's say, a, a little investigation about the temperature up there on a rooftop in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. It was analyzed by UNLV and found out that that, that that temperature up there really did not increase much at all uh, with those enclosed conductors in there, especially if they weren't mounted right on the roof. So if they were up a distance, um, you know, half an inch, up to three and a half, if they were up separated from the roof, then that heat from the roof could be dissipated by the air. And so this table has been eliminated, will no longer be in the 2017 National Logical Code. Gets us to chapter four now. And uh, I can tell you that other than the new articles we have, we'll probably only have a few slides left because I did want to give you uh, time for some questions. And this is just a snapshot of all the, all the changes. Of course, we just can't handle a lot of changes in an hour, but they're talking here about controlled receptacle marking. So we have a building automation system that is going to control a receptacle. Maybe, um, you know, they, they believe that at from 11 o'clock at night until 8 o'clock in the morning, nobody's going to use these receptacles. We're going to turn them off. So that's fine. But now they have to be identified. So it's telling us that all non-locking type uh, 125 volt, 15 and 20 amp receptacles that are controlled by some type of automation system has to be permanently marked with the symbol. When that symbol is going to be this symbol right here, which we did see in previous uh, code cycles, and it's also going to have to have the word controlled on it. So the marking has to be located on the receptacle face, has to be part of the receptacle and visible after installation 
can be a can be a sticker that we put on the faceplate. Faceplate can be taken off, a new faceplate put on. So this is going to have to be right on the receptacle face itself. And so very good. That would tell us, boy, I plugged into this, nothing's working. Well, that's because it's being controlled by somebody, um, you know, in in um, Washington D.C. or whatever. So the the last change that I wanted to go over, and this is also in Chapter Four uh, in 406 under receptacles. And uh, this gives us a little bit idea that sometimes uh, technology is so quick that it might uh, surpass one of our code cycles because these receptacles have been available for a while now. But if we do have a receptacle with a USB charger, it does have to be listed. So some type of listing um, agency or organization is going to have to list this because they, they were adding on these charges uh, to existing receptacles and it just wasn't a a great uh, way to charge um, some of our electronic equipment. So these will all be UL listed. If they are not, they are not going to be uh, uh, legal to install uh, in our equipment. At this time, I am going to turn it back over to Eric. He's going to take the controls back, and he is going to wrap this uh, up for us. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bob, and great information. Uh, we really appreciate everything that you've been able to deliver for our audience here today. And did want to let everyone know that uh, you have just a minute to get questions in uh, before we wrap this up. And of course, if you're not able to get a question answered in the context of the presentation, we'll be happy to follow up with you. And as I said, we're providing Bob's email address at the end of this presentation, so you can always email him directly. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do to give everybody a chance to get questions in, uh, and again, that can be done through the little question interface there in uh, GoToTraining or in GoToWebinar, you just type your question in there. Uh, but in the meantime, I will share our poll results. So our question was, do you need CEUs on any seat to maintain your license? And 55% of our audience uh, said yes, they are in that position, 31% no, another 14% not sure. That's pretty typical. We have a real mix of folks uh, on the webinar today, uh, some technicians, some supervisors, and so a real mix out there in terms of the need uh, for those CEUs uh, in order to maintain the license. But of course that is an important part of what we do, so I'll just uh, I'll, I'll end it by noting that before we turn it over to questions. So let me close this. And the note I want to end on before questions is simply to say we're here to help. This is what we do. Uh, and if you'll visit the URL that we provided on the PowerPoint there at tbctraingo.com slash NEC 2017, you'll see our full schedule. Uh, through the end of 2017, we have over 100 two-day code class scheduled. Um, so you've seen today just a preview. Uh, if you're looking for CEUs, if uh, you're looking for actual training on the new code cycle, you need to attend that two-day training. Those dates are available there. If you don't find a date that works for you, uh, an on-site option might be right for you and your company. Uh, we provided an email address for that as well at sales at tpctrainco.com. We'd love to work with you on either one of those aspects of your electrical training needs. But we want to make sure that we get a couple questions in here. and It looks like a couple have come in last minute. So uh, first of all, I'm going to make sure, Bob, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions that we'll try to get in here uh, before we close it out. Uh, the first question is regarding table 310.15 B3C, are the temperature derating tables supplied by the Copper Development Association no longer valid? That yeah, we, can, we can use that table if we want to maybe go above and beyond the National Electrical Code, but, but unless that wiring method is installed right on the rooftop itself, then we don't have to worry ab about that table. If we are above the roof, then we don't have to make any adjustment at all for what 310.15b16 tells us. Thanks, Bob. And then a question from John. Who is responsible for marking the available fault current on service equipment? That would be the installer of the equipment. So whoever installs that equipment, if it's a licensed electrician, then they've got to be able to make that determination on fault current. They, they could uh, maybe get some outside help from some engineering uh, services, but it's going to be whoever installs that equipment. That's now part of our installation requirements, that we have to have that available fault current on that service equipment. 
Okay, and then the uh, last question related, in the NFPA 70E, it indicates that counts for arc flash, arc fault hazard must be done by an engineer. What qualification is required? Okay, so a professional engineer should stamp an incident energy uh, analysis. So it's a, it's a very detailed process. Uh, they're usually using um, some type of software that uh, they have purchased. Uh, it could be based on the 1584 calculation, but it should be a, a stamped document by a professional engineer to be able to put that uh, calorie rating on that label in 70E. Great, thanks. And I believe that's everything that we've got. There are a couple of questions that came through that are logistical in nature, wanting to know if they could get a copy of the slide deck. And yes, if you'll send us an email, uh, you can either uh, reply directly to the email that you, you get as a follow-up or uh, respond to Bob here, the email address on the screen, and we'll send you a copy of the, of the deck. And last request for you, uh, first of all, thank you all for attending before I make the request. appreciate you giving us an hour of your time today. And as I said, I hope to see you at an upcoming code class. And, uh, Bob and, and many of our other qualified instructors will be conducting those classes uh, throughout the code cycle. And then my last request is, as I close the seminar, you will see a, a poll up here on the screen that asks you to, uh, to rate the quality of the seminar and its usefulness to you. That's great input for us if you take just a minute to answer that. Thank you so much for, for tuning in. And thank you, Bob.